Hey everyone, this is RookieCub314 and I am bringing you another modding tutorial for creating generated structures in Minecraft. Today we are going to look at improved structure distribution on the map using a Houghton quasi-random number sequence. Don't let the name scare you, it's actually decently easy to program, but it is a bit in-depth and it is a bit um, upper level conceptual mathematical stuff, so um, I'm going to try to do this slowly and um, try to help you guys realize what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. So we're going to begin with taking a look at the Houghton sequence itself and kind of what we're going to try to do. Um, this is the result of putting 256 points on a board using a typical random number generator. As you can see, there's a great deal of clustering, like in this area here, and some very blank areas here. Um, you know, if you want that, that's okay, but in many instances, you're going to have a lot of overlapping points, like you've got these, you've got this clustery mess here. To try to prevent structures from overlapping, um, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to improve the distribution of structures over the map using the Houghton sequence. This is the kind of distribution we're looking to get, and this is what the Houghton sequence is going to give us. So what we're looking at now is going to be a general um, description of kind of what a Houghton sequence is doing. Um, a Houghton sequence uses two of another kind of pseudo-random sort of sequence, I forgot the name of it, it's like Vander Corpet or something. Um, the exact name isn't really all that relevant for this, but the way this is going to work is um, each number in a sequence is going to go, it's going to input 0, 1, 2, 3, those are going to be the input numbers. Um, you're also going to have a base number, we're going to set that equal to 2 here. Um, what that means is with each new iteration of this sequence we are going to divide um, the interval here by the base number. So actually we are going to erase the zero here because zero is not going to be a good number for when we actually do the um, algorithm. So the first number the result of your first number is going to, oops, where's my, there we are. I'm going to divide it here. Your first number is going to be one half. So your input was one, that's going to get you one half. If you're to input two, you get, do, do, do. One fourth. So two gets you one fourth. Your third number will get you. Sorry, it's been a while since I've used paint. Three fourths. So three. Uh, th three will get you three fourths. Four will get you. 1 8th, 5 will get you 3 8 6 will get you 5 8 7 will get you 7 8 And the idea behind this particular algorithm is to place each successive point um, as far away from all the other points as is possible. You're supposed to increase we're supposed to try to get the most amount of distance between a point you place and other points on this line. Um, and the best way to do so is to divide each interval into um, a certain number of pieces. This is going to be based on this base number and then placing points at those locations. So if this was three instead, we would, we would have one third, if this base number was three, we would have one third 2 3rd, 1 9th, 2 9th, 4 9th, 5 9th, uh, 7 9ths, 8 9ths. Um, 
and it would have a fairly even distribution of the numbers along that line as well. Um, the reason why it's important is the Houghton sequence uses two of those kinds of linear sequences with different base numbers to produce something like this top left portion here, um, which looks like the, the numbers or the points are fairly evenly distributed. I mean, yeah, you've got some clustering here. Um, if you were to increase the number of points here, it would definitely look more like this. This is 256 points that were put into a Houghton sequence generator, and this is the distribution of them. Uh, this is what we want to do with Minecraft because we want to try to increase the distance between structures um, to the point where they're not going to overlap. But we also want to make, we also want to use an algorithm, the quasi, a quasi-random number sequence algorithm that's going to be fairly easy to implement. And luckily, the Houghton sequence is pretty easy. So we're back in our code. Um, what I've done. I've got a whole lot of code that's been commented out. Um, don't worry about that, we'll get to that. Um, first thing I want to show you is I have created this, a private double spawn chance. Now, this line represents the uh, percent, the actual percent chance, sort of, that um, the structure has to spawn in a chunk. This is similar, going to be used similarly, or it has the same kind of purpose that this portion of the code here does. I don't know how similar this was to how it was before. I've moved some code around, um, tried to move it back so we could do some stuff, but this is, um, we were using this, but we're now going to use something similar with this private double spawn chance. Now, the way we are going to use the Houghton grid, or the Houghton pseudo-random number sequence, is we are going to create a grid of Boolean values. And we are going to compare the chunk number we are generating in with, the, with this grid to see if that num to see if that grid, if that bit is one where we can form there, we can form a structure there or not. But to do that, we are going to need an array to compare our chunk against. What we're actually going to use is something called a bit set. This is more space efficient than trying to do a large array um, of booleans in Java, because unfortunately, arrays of booleans in Java, um, instead of using one bit for information, they use an entire byte. So they actually use eight times a regular boolean array. uses eight times as much space as it actually needs to. A bit set's a bit more efficient, so it's um, safer to use with larger numbers than a boolean array because with Minecraft, um, your space usage is something that you're going to really have to keep an eye on. So, what we're also going to do, we're also going to have something called a private final int Houghton grid side length. What this is, is this is going to be the number of chunks on each side of a square against which we will compare the chunk numbers in the world. Um, this note here, that's here because I don't know if there's a way to create it, to create an easier to work with two-dimensional bit set. Um, there's a way to work with it to work with a one-dimensional array or in this case sort of an array like structure without actually having to make it two-dimensional. There are ways to do that. It's uh, first year computer science kind of stuff, but I'll show you how to get that to work. Anyway, this is the length of your Houghton grid side length. Now, we are going to show you, I'm going to show you the actual algorithm for generating the Houghton numbers. 
Now, if you'll remember, this algorithm generates numbers between 0 and 1. Um, it takes an index and a base, as we showed you in Paint, um, and it just it goes through this code. It's not too complex. Um, if you want to follow along with it, you can to make certain this is actually working. Um, but what you need to do is you need to make certain that you are returning a float because the numbers in here are all fractions and if you try to return an integer uh, the only number this is going to return is zero and it's going to be um, not very useful at all. So this function generates numbers between zero and one. And that's important to note because if we were to try to use this directly, um, since the chunk numbers are integers and not floats, if we were to try to use the number from here directly, uh, the only place we could actually generate something is in chunk zero, is in chunk zero zero. We don't want that. We want to be able to use this a little easier. So we're going to create a function called populate Halton. I'm just screwing stuff up everywhere. Okay. Now, what we're going to do with this is we're going to create this for loop. Um, the reason why we have this as the upper bound is the spawn chance is the number, the percentage of chunks in a given area that will have a structure in it. Now, our square Houghton grid is a thousand chunks long. To get the total number of chunks in there, you have to multiply, or you have to square this number, which is why I had this note here. So, um, you are going to go through um, you're going to go through your grid a certain number of times and mark the correct number of places true in order to get the correct spawn chance. So you're going to take your spawn chance times the one million that you've actually got up here in your bit set or that you're going to be using. Um, and for each item in here, you're going to set a value somewhere uh, in this bit set to be true. And where that's going to be set is based on this Houghton function. So now we're going to go into our Houghton function. Um, the Z coordinate, I set that way, you'll see in this third line later on. Um, the way this is going to work is you're going to use two base numbers. Um, let's actually do those now. Um, I'm going to change this to 3. Uh, and the reason why I'm changing that to 3 is because the example on Wikipedia uses 2 and 3 as the base numbers, which in certain situations is okay. Um, I like to use numbers that are a little further apart. I'm going to explain that here in a little bit, but you have to have one coordinate whose Houghton sequence is a number that's different from the other one. That's one of the requirements for the two numbers up here. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to use the Houghton sequence to get a number that's between 0 and 1. Then you're going to multiply that number by 1,000 to get a number that's between 0 and 1,000. Um, and that's going to include 0 and exclude. Actually, no, at this point it's going to... This should be okay. Um, but anyway, since this number is a double, when it multiplies by this integer, it's still going to be a double. And you need to cast it to an integer to turn it into an integer. And this number, this number is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1,000, including 0, not including 1,000. Since we are converting a double into an integer, this is going to round down. So you will not get the number 1,000, but you will get the number 0. You're going to do something similar with the x-coordinate, but you're going to use a different base number. 
Now, this line is going to determine which bit in the Houghton grid is set. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to take our Z coordinate, multiply it by a thousand, in this case Houghton grid site length, and then we're going to add X coordinate to it. Um, the reason why is uh, just make a little drawing, a little thing here. That's better. Okay, let's say if what we were actually dealing with was a 5x5 five five array instead of a 1000 by 1000 array. Um, and we want to turn uh, this one. We want to turn that bit to a different value. So we've got a question mark in there instead of a number sign. <coughs> the array we were actually working with would be something like, um, it would be 25 units long instead of a five by five thing. So in order to find the correct place to place the question mark, we have to look at the two coordinates that we've got. Um, your Z coordinate, in this little example, uh, with this being the z-axis and this being 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's actually do that. And then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 on the x-axis is going from left to right. But on this, but for the z-axis, it's going to be up to down. Um, so your y direction, or your z direction, sorry, uh, your z coordinate is equal to two, whereas your x coordinate is equal to four. But your actual index, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. No, sorry, I oopsie, that should be 3. Okay. It should be 3 because this starts at 0. Anyway, your actual coordinate will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Your actual coordinate is equal to 13. So the way to get 13 from these two numbers is you have to multiply your z coordinate by your side length. Your, your z coordinate by your uh, x coordinate length which in this case is 5 because your x coordinates can go to 5. Um, this is in case you've got a multi-dimensional array that's got an unusual dimension, plus x coordinate. So in this case, it's going to be 2 times 5 plus 3 equals 13. And that is the correct, that is the correct index for getting this position here. Similarly, up here in this line, we are going to use your z coordinate times your side length plus your x coordinate. And that is how we get the correct location in a one dimensional array if you're doing stuff with a two dimensional array. So now that we've got a function that uses populate Houghton, we need to actually use the populate Houghton function. And the way we're going to do that is we are actually going to create a constructor for World Gen Tutorial. We haven't needed to do one so far, but since we are doing something that should only be done once um, anytime a world is created, then um, anytime you create a world generator, you are going to do this populate Houghton function. 
when you create the world generator. Because you only ever want to do this once because you only need one reference array. Um, I might be able to do something with Java to make sure that only happens once. I'm not really sure how to do that because I'm not all that well versed with Java and visibility and global stuff, so yeah. Anyway, what you now have is you have the Houghton grid, you have two base numbers, um, I'll get to that in a minute. You have the function which creates the Houghton sequence, you have the function which scales up that sequence to fit into the Houghton grid and then put stuff in the grid. And then you have your constructor which is being run in your mod file um, when you create the world generator which actually populates the Houghton array. So you now have your reference array. So let me real quickly, um, we're not using the reference array just yet, but let me real quickly explain what you need as far as these two base numbers. Now, the requirements for these base numbers to get them to work is that they need to be something called co-prime, which means that the greatest common denominator between the two numbers needs to be one. Um, it also has to be greater than one. Um, if you try to do one or zero, the Houghton function is not going to work. Um, so it needs to be two or greater, and it needs to be an integer. Um, I've looked online at some research with stuff because this Houghton function is actually used with statistics and some high-level particle physics stuff. Um, so there's some papers out there about uh, some base choices that are good or bad. And you don't want to go above, I think, 14 on these base numbers because then you start getting um, some easily identifiable patterns in the distribution. Um, you start getting lines going across the map of structures. And you really don't want that. So uh, one thing you could do is 2 and 3. But um, that's just a very basic thing to do. But what I think happens if you have two base numbers that are very close together, like 2 and 3, um, I think what happens with that is you start getting clustering a little bit more often. I mean, I know this is supposed to try to prevent clustering, but depending on how many points you have, there is some general clustering. For example, if we only went to here, if we did 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If our maximum number here was 5, we would have clustering on this end of the spectrum because we would not have this line. We would not have this line. So there would appear to be clustering over here if our index, maximum index here was 5. Um, it's a similar problem uh, that we're going to face depending on um, what the spawn chance is. Oh, by the way, you probably don't want this to go above 10%. Um, you might want to do you might want to do more, but um, even with the Houghton sequence, you still risk having a whole bunch of structures clustering together. Um, the higher the spawn chance is. So, with the base numbers, what I like to do is I like to make certain that they are co-prime, but that they are further apart. So, instead of two and three. I do 2 and 7. Um, the numbers themselves do not have to be prime, they have to be co-prime. So you can do 4 in here. You could do 4 and 7, and that works because um, the highest denominator that either one of these has in common is 1, um, even though 4 is not a prime number. But I'm going to go back to 2 because that creates a nice difference there. That um, should make that work fairly well. But now that we have the base numbers, now that I've explained that, and we're populating the Houghton function, we now, or the Houghton grid, we now need to use the Houghton grid. Okay. Before we actually use the Houghton sequence, what we, or, yeah, before we start comparing it 
chunks to the Houghton grid, what we need to do is we need to look at how chunks are actually generated or how they're numbered in the world because there's some things here you might notice that will make, that are very significant to comparing chunks against an array that you'll have to take into account in order to get this to work correctly. I did not do so in the previous version of video part 6. Um, that's why it started crashing. Um, I've, I've got it fixed and I know exactly what went wrong and I'm going to show you why. Okay. What we have here is we have a grid which, exa which examines the um, most difficult case scenario of a set of chunks generating which is at the world origin where this is in the negative x direction, positive x direction, negative z, positive z. Um, I'm going to create three uh, let's this through, did I? <sighs> Fine, let's just do that one. Anyway, so let's say we've got structures at these three points. Something else we need to keep in mind, um, we are also going to assume that our um, the size of the array that we are comparing against, we're going to assume that that is no, not six, five. We're going to assume the length, the side length of the array we're comparing against is five, just to make things a little bit easier on us. So we have a structure at x coordinates, x chunk coordinates 1, at coordinates 1, 2, coordinates 3, 4, and coordinates 3, 0. Um, and that's x, z coordinates. Now, if we were to try to take the chunk numbers and compare them directly against the Houghton grid, the only ones that would work without crashing or working incorrectly would be in this quadrant where both numbers are positive. If you try to put a negative number into an array, uh, it's going to crash. So we need, first of all, to figure out a way to get these numbers to be positive. And the first thing that you might want to do is do absolute value. What that will do is I'll change these numbers into, into 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, 5. Same here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we're going to do, do, do the previous ones. Sorry about how some of these are aligned. Um, That's kind of what happens when you're working in paint. Okay, so if you take the absolute values of your chunk numbers, this is what you're going to be left with. Um, it's closer, but what you, want, what you want to actually do is you want to take this array and you want to tile it along or on these parts. So you want this structure here to appear right here. So our target coordinates I'm going to make pink uh, with a line tool. Whoa, not that big. Okay. I need to do that on that edge because of that. Uh, and then we're going to need to do it on this edge down here. Just looking at where I actually need to use the line tool. Because I didn't think to make the background a different color. 
Okay. So if we're going to if we're going to be tiling our structures across, then oops, no, here, 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 do 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 here, 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 here. Those pink locations are where we actually want to spawn structures because we want to tile. We want to tile this array across the entire map. Um, but with our current with our current indices, this is not going to work very well. Um, so that's why we have to do some stuff to modify the map coordinates into coordinates that will actually fit into the Houghton grid correctly. So you start off with an absolute value, which did this. Now one thing that you need to remember is there are no negative zero chunk numbers. That's very important because what we have to do is we now have to shift these numbers based on um, whether the original number was negative or not. So first we took the absolute value. Now we're going to that large. Twelve. Index minus one. If actually we're gonna say I. I minus one. If I is less than zero. Now what this is gonna do this is your first step is take the absolute value. Your second step is then to shift your numbers downward um, so that one, uh, let's go back to eight, one becomes zero, two becomes two, becomes, oh my god, three becomes two, four becomes three, five becomes four. Same thing is going to happen here. Zero, one, two, three, four. So this is what you're going to get after the i minus 1 if i is less than 0, with i standing in for the index. Um, the index passed through here, so you got your absolute value, then you subtracted 1 if it was less than 0. Now um, we are getting closer to the point where the numbers in each of these quadrants look like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, except it's reversed here and it's reversed here. Um, if you were to try to do this now, what you would get instead is you would get a mirror image of this. You would get it in a mirror image along this way and rotated 180 degrees here. To fix this, you need to do another thing in the event that this is uh -oh, 0, uh, 12. What you need to do is you need to take your index number, you need to subtract it from length minus 1. So L minus 1 minus I if I is less than 0. Now in this instance, what this means is at zero, at zero, you're going to subtract zero from L, length, zero from five, which is five, minus one is four. So this becomes four. Five minus one is four, minus one is three. 5 minus 2 is 3, and minus 1 is 2. 5 minus 3 is 2, minus 1 is 1. 
5 minus 4 is 1, minus 1 is 0. And similarly, you're going to get 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And what you'll notice now is your axes, your axes here in this quadrant are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so that your this direction and this direction is positive in this quadrant. But if you'll notice, the same is also true in all three of these quadrants. So, by passing your indices, that are by passing your negative indices through these three um, manipulations, that zero should be up here. By passing your negative indices through these three manipulations, you can correctly translate this quadrant to these three quadrants. So now that you understand the concept behind that, we're now back to our code and actually do that. We're going to go to our generate overworld function. We're going to create two indices, index x, index z. They're going to be equal to the absolute value of the number that we pass in. So it's going to be absolute value of positive and negative numbers, which is with positive numbers isn't going to do anything. Oops. Now, we're going to shift the um, indices down by one. Uh, we're going to shift the absolute value of the index down by one if the original index was less than zero. So if the x number passed in here is less than zero, then you're going to reduce this number down by one, same to z. That was the uh, second step we did here, i minus one if i is less than zero. One step I forgot to mention, because um, it wasn't all that important at the time, is now that you've shifted your indices, what you need to do is you need to make sure that any chunk numbers that are larger than 1,000 um, are truncated down to where they are less than 1,000. Maybe not truncated, but you're going to do index x mod grid side length. That will make sure that anything greater, any numbers at or greater than 1,000 even after these two are going to wrap around to 0, 1, 2. Um, that way you can keep, that way you have a grid of fixed length that you tile across the map no matter what direction you're going in. You do the same thing with index Z. And that's going to keep everything below 1,000. And the reason why you want to do that is you want to make sure that your grid is keeping an upper limit so that you can do this next step. And this is the negative axis reversal that we were looking at earlier. Uh, this is the third step in, our, in the paint demonstration, L minus 1 minus I if I is less than 0. Except in this instance, um, i is equal to, this is our length, our side length, minus 1, and then minus the original index. And that flips an index around if it was negative. So now that we've all done all of these fun index manipulation shenanigans, let's use them. If houghtongrid.get, which, which um, what that will do is that will get an index from the array. Um, we're going to use the same method that we use to put stuff into a single dimensional array like it's a two dimensional array here that we did right here. We're going to use the same, the same way if index x times, or index z times a side length plus x. Do not get x and z mixed up in this instance or you're going to screw stuff up. Um, then you're going to, oops, 
let's get rid of that function, that's for later. Then you're going to have your generation code in here. Because what this does, this line takes the place of the if random.nextint mod 100 is equal to 10, or sorry, if mod 10 is equal to 0. This takes place of that because um, at any specific location you only have a um, approximately 15% chance of stuff spawning even though we're not using a random number generator, we're using this Houghton grid. Um, what the Houghton grid does is it makes sure that things are more distributed than a random number generator. So um, it's a bit difficult to demonstrate this, but I am going to go ahead and try. Uh, sorry, one quick note. I forgot to actually get rid of this line, so <laughs> it's going to be much less. Since we don't need to check that there, um, we're just going to check to make certain that it's out of water. One thing we're also going to do, we're going to increase the spawn chance from 5%, which is what we had up here, up to 10%. One last thing we're going to do, um, I've actually got a few other structures ready for my multiple structures video, but I'm going to use one of them here. Um, I'm going to move these four lines of code out here because we're going to use random x and random z. Um, yeah, we're going to use these for two different structures at the same time. Um, this is going to demonstrate something we'll see in the multiple structures video. Um, yeah. So, this bit of the code will use the Houghton grid to generate the fence house. I'm going to generate a second structure using the same generation parameters we had last time. So, if. No, 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 no. If random.next int. Uh, 100 mod 10 is equal to 0 and not in water similar code to how you just do this. I'll show you more about this in the next video. Uh, hopefully this should show structure spawning in two different ways. One final thing we're going to do before we actually test this is we are going to move our Houghton specific code into a utility class. Um, this was something I tried after I got the other parts of this video recorded so that's why I kind of tacked on here. Um, I'm just going to call this util. Um, okay, so it's going to open the util class. Now what you want to do is you want to go to your world generator file. You're going to take the Houghton grid, your two base numbers, and the Houghton grid side length. You're going to copy them, delete them, and then put them in your util class. Save real quick. You've got a whole bunch of errors in here, but we will get that fixed. Take the populate Houghton and Houghton functions, copy and delete, and put them in util. Uh, okay, now you've got one error in here. What you need to do in your populate Houghton function is you need to have a double chance. Actually, let's just change that to spawn chance. There's no reason to change that name. Spawn chance. Okay, I'm going to save. Now, we're going to change this from populate Houghton to util.populate Houghton. Save real quick. It still has an error. Oh, yep, so we have 
add that. <clears throat> okay. Should have a new error. Uh, whoops. Wasn't the error I thought. Okay. You have to change the visibility of these from private to public. Uh, or for, of only populate Halton. Don't do so with Halton. Uh, you really don't need to do that. Uh, this line you also need to change to public. I'm just going to put public in here for the Houghton Bridge just in case. Now, here we go. It says change the modifier of populate Houghton to static. Which we went ahead and did. Now we've got a bunch of errors and we're going to change Houghton Grid to static. Houghton Grid to static, base 1 to static, base 2 to static, I think, yeah, and I think what these do is they make sure there's only going to be one version of that function. Um, available no matter how many times. Um, the, utility class, the utility class really shouldn't be instantiated. Um, what? Okay. So that error is now gone. Um, we're going to scroll further down. The generate overworld function. Um, if you look at the indices that we used, uh, they use the exact same kind of code throughout all their manipulations. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a function in the util class called Houghton Index. Uh, no, 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 public. Uh, int Houghton index. Um, okay. What we're now going to do, we're going to do int uh, the index is equal to math.absolute value of input. If input is less than zero, oh, whoopsie, is less than zero, then ah. input, no, 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 not input, the index minus minus. Now the index is equal to the index mod. Houghton grid side length. If input is less than zero, uh, okay. Uh, the index is equal to Houghton grid side length minus one minus the index. and return the index. This will do all the manipulation stuff that we had to do here in case we had negative numbers. So index x is equal to util dot Houghton index x and this needs to be static util dot Halson index z if I can type stuff right okay so now we're going to go down here remove that and save. Okay, now 
Um, I'm going to put this line in a function just to make it a little bit easier to read. Public static r ports in the coordinates Houghton. Int x, int z. Oops, public static, I need a type. Boolean R coordinate static. Not static, oh my god. I'm saying things wrong. And copy this. Uh, R chords Halton index X index Z. Return Halton grid dot get Z X. Save that. Uh, C O O R D S. What is wrong with you? Oh, that's why I'm being dumb. Util.r coordinates help. Okay. Save. Um, this should do the same thing that the code was doing previously. Okay, we're back in the game. And the two different structures I've got spawning are the structure we worked on in video 5, which is this one. And then we've got this one, which is a modified version of the structure that was made in the previous version of video 5. Um, it doesn't have the door, I'll show you how to do that later. But, uh, it's kind of difficult to see, but the distance between certain structures, between the cobblestone houses, is a little bit more even than your um, than these more wooden houses. And the wooden houses use the previous way of generating structures. If you'll notice, you'll recognize the two cubes that are right next to each other. Um, that spawn using the old algorithm. The new one spawn the, the new algorithm has the new house spawning at it, and um, yeah, even though you've got some clustering over here, uh, that's because we've got a 1 in, ten, 1 in 10 chance of a structure spawning at, at any particular location. That's kind of ridiculously high when you think about how common generated structures actually are. Um, We've got structure spawning one on top of another, right where doo -doo 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 -doo, the tree was. I'm going to mark these coordinates because this is something I want to see next time. But anyway, um, they're better distributed overall. And this is the algorithm that I'm going to choose to use. Uh, when we actually spawn structures in general. So that is the Houghton distribution. If you reduce the number of buildings, you're going to get a better distribution. Um, you can also play around with the... Um, you can play around with the base numbers for the Houghton sequences to uh, see if you get any combinations which work better. Um, as I said, you probably don't want to go much above 14. So, yeah, since we have now worked with the Houghton sequence, hopefully I did not fry your brain too much, so I will see you in the next video.